I'm delighted to welcome you to the podium, Francis West. Good morning. Um, I want to um, thank Sarah for that introduction. Uh, I also know Sarah from the past, and it's great to see a, a, a colleague and, um, at Google. And uh, this is a very um, um, exciting day for me personally. Uh, like Sarah said, I spent quite a few years in IBM, and my last job was uh, IBM's chief accessibility officer. Um, but now I have my own consulting company because my last job actually was probably the most meaningful job I ever had at IBM. I, um, I came to this uh, topic about um, human-centric um, technology impact on future society uh, in my last job because I spent my entire years in IBM in the first two-thirds of my lives, really learning about technology, selling technology, and market technology. And um, it's not until my last job in IBM Research, where my organization was um, located, that I realized this fundamental concept of diversity really brings disruptive innovation. And many of you, um, in this audience or outside in this tech community know that the topic of inclusion is a very, top, a very big topic, right? And, uh, but when it comes down to it, what I realize is that inclusion, in many cases, at least in today's uh, environment, a lot of times is cast as more of an HR, a human resource initiative. And a lot of people talk about inclusion as a kind of um, what we call the constituency topic, you know, gender, race, um, and so on, or religion. But the way I look at diversity is that it really brings to bear the heart of innovation. And let me just give you a little bit of a history of by myself and give you a little bit of a journey of my personal kind of uh, growth in this area and they share with you why I believe that diversity is the core of it, disruptive innovation. I was in the United States three years with kind of a broken English. I went to a campus interview in Lexington, Virginia, Lexington Kentucky with a manager by the name of Frank Friedersdorf. Just based on that name, you can tell that it's kind of a German descent um, name. And um, at that time, I only had waitressing in a Chinese restaurant as my experience. Um, I sat down in front of this Frank, uh, Frank Friedersdorf manager from IBM and gave him what I thought my Chinese waitressing job would bring to my understanding of customer service. At the end of a one hour interview, he said to me, Francis, oh, then he asked me the very crucial question, do you have a green card or permanent residency? I'm like, no, I don't. But I am going to marry what my brother called a foreign devil. Oh, by the way, <laughs> that's why I have a last name of West, far from being East. Um, so I said to him, I'm going to get a, I'm going to marry a foreign devil. I didn't say that. I, I'm going to marry American. I'm going to get my citizenship. And then so he said, Great, Francis, go get married, have a nice honeymoon, you have a job with IBM. So this gentleman, Frank Friedersdorf, was the first person in my life that really practiced what I call authentic inclusion, in the sense that I hardly know English, I didn't have a green card, and yet he believed in me of what I could become. I didn't even know what I could do at that time. Anyway, that's how I started IBM career. Um, in the next 20 some years, um, I helped IBM so, uh, sell mainframe. For those of you who don't know what mainframe is, anybody watch the, uh, the movie Hidden Figures? Okay, that's a mainframe. We worked on 
technology to put people on the moon. We worked on technology built at the American Airline um, Sabre system, which you still use today for uh, airline reservation. We built a system for social security administration. So at that time, the technology was all about um, putting what we call the uh, infrastructure system or business system to be more effective, to be more efficient. And I remember back then, the key word as a systems engineer, I was trained to think about on behalf of the customer are three key words, RAS. RAS stands for reliability, availability, and serviceability. So that was an era where the computer is all about system opti optimization. And because of that, um, kind of a knowledge and also um, a background I had, I actually had the opportunity to be the first wave of IBMers to go to China in the mid-90s. And one of my, I will still say, my biggest accomplishment was actually helping the Chinese government to build the China payment system, which is the Federal Reserve equivalent of interbank clearing system. So we're talking about big system handling uh, at the beginning of the check processing and then what we call the uh, payment infrastructure. So all these are very exciting, you know, um, learning, a profession, a professional growth and all that. And then I came back from a Chinese, uh, a China assignment in the early 2000s, I had the opportunity to join IBM Research to head up this organization called IBM Human Ability and Accessibility Center. And frankly, I knew very little about accessibility. How many of you here know about accessibility? Okay. So for those of you who don't know accessibility, in the technical world or in the technology or definition, it's about, think of it in the ultimate objective accessibility is about digital inclusion. Meaning you want to make sure that the technology solution or product or apps that you put out there, that every human being on this planet can use it. Not just some, but all. When I say all, I mean people who are aging or people who has disabilities. The disability can be vision related, could be hearing related, could be mobi mobility related, and most important, could be cognitive related. So part of the job and the mission of our organization was to make sure that everything coming out of IBM at the time is as accessible as possible, first and foremost to our employees, and then won't, because we want to eat your own dog food, once we make sure that our employee can be productive, actually, uh, earlier you were saying it was um, it's equity engineering. That's exactly the kind of a goal that we're striving for, which is there is parity and equity of everybody who come to work. And then we learned a lot about that process and then, uh, um, and then was able to help our customer to become more accessible. So in that job, I thought for sure that I would do it for three years, which is kind of a track record I had at IBM at the time. Because you want to move on, you want to get promoted. And even in big company, I'm sure in Google, you, know, you want to try different things um, to, to, to widen your experience base. Little did I know that that became, started out to be a job, then became a career and then become a calling. Because for the first time I realized of all the glamour I got from selling big systems to Chinese government and, and installing um, CAT CAM system with Raytheon, pair, you know, cannot compare to the satisfaction I got when I work with a person with disabilities and to see that how he or she can perform at work with the same kind of enthusiasm and productivity. So that is the essence of what, this, what the Accessibility Center was about. And from there, we really led the innovation. Why? Because on our staff, inside IBM Research, we actually have people with disabilities. We have blind engineer. We have deaf scientists innovating and creating new solutions 
because every single day they have to deal with issues or challenges. And in many cases, their perspective is so creative, is so out of the box thinking that it just create a, what we call the disruptive kind of innovation. So that is what I personally not only saw but experienced. And uh, after working uh, in this capacity and then became IBM Chief Assistant Officer, and it's around 2016 time frame, and we all know around 2016, frankly, that was the beginning where there's a lot of uh, talk about, for example, the Silicon Valley diversity issues, right? And, uh, and like I said, personally, because of my own journey, I had the opportunity to experience, one would say, because I am, at this point, you probably know, can tell, I am um, first generation, non-English speaking, Chinese, and woman in tech, and also a over age 50. So I kind of check the box of every inclusion um, criteria. So just like the State Farm Insurance commercial, we know a few because we have seen a few. So from my personal perspective, I felt like there is a tremendous amount of um, story needs to be told to really put the inclusion, not just as an HR kind of uh, a perspective. It's not just about hiring, but it's about innovation. And that we are at the critical point in our history of technology that company like Google, especially Google, you guys are in the forefront of technology innovation, really have to think about this topic very, very seriously. And that you really have the capacity and also to a large extent your responsibility to make sure that technology innovation from this point on and going forward has all human needs and all human wants into consideration. Now, why do I say that? So earlier I talked about in my era of a computer or technology, we were focusing on system optimization. We're focused on, like I said, reliability, service availability, and service availability. But in the past 10, 15 years, we all know that the technology has moved from a system optimization model to a personal optimization or personal experience model. We begin to see the trend, especially the emergence of mobile, right? When mobile came onto the scene, I remember before mobile uh, devices become prevalent, to talk about accessibility was a very difficult topic. You know, you go up to a, you know, 25 year old, you know, um, fresh college grad, and you say, you need to think about people who are aging. Somehow, it just doesn't quite resonate, right? Because they just want to code, they want to get things out, they want, they want fancy um, kind of a screen experience, you know, everything kind of a, a flash and, and fly in and all that. They don't think about how cognitively kind of a confusing it could be for a person with disabilities or aging. But when the mobile phone came along, you know, when I start talking to people and say, you know what, the font size matters. All of a sudden people were like, yeah. You know, when it was too small font, like size 11 or 12, I cannot see on my cell phone. Color contrast, when you stand in the sun, if you don't have enough color contrast, you won't be able to read. When you are on the go, because mobile and enable all the work, uh, everybody to be on the go, when you're at the airport, you know, when you're listening on that conference call and there's a lot of ambient noise, you cannot hear. Wouldn't it be nice if you have captioning? So all of a sudden, all these fundamental accessibility or human-centric technology requirement becomes universally relevant because every one of us could be temporarily or what I call situationally disabled. So with the technology coming to what I call the personalized experience, and Google, you guys actually lead some of the effort with your Android platform and also your you know, search engine 
affects every single person on the planet. I just saw the news that Google is trying to re-enter China market. So that's another what, 1.6 billion people? One quarter of the, um, of the population on Earth? Oh, by the way, do you know, for example, I talked about aging. Do you know that China by, 20, uh, by 2025 will have over 360 million people over age 65? That's the entire population of the United States. I was just in China in March, and I was invited to speak as the only kind of outside speaker um, to the Chinese uh, companies like Alibaba, Baidu, and Tencent on the topic of accessibility. Now, why would China talk about accessibility? Today in the United States, um, if you are progressive thinking companies, like Google, like IBM, in this case, Microsoft recently have done a lot of work in accessibility area, then you think about accessibility not as a compliance topic. But a lot of companies today, because United States is a litigious society and because we have American Disability Act, a lot of technologies, their first experience with accessibility is tied to ADA, Section 508 compliance. How many of you know of the legislation of ADA that apply to digital accessibility? Not many. Let me tell you, this is a trend and this is a phenomenon that's not going to go away. So in the United States, if you are a government procurement company, which I think Google is, right? If you want to bid federal government business like Department for Department of Defense, or NASA, or uh, Social Security, or Veterans Affair. If you want to be a federal contractor, you must prove that your product is accessible. European Union just passed a similar law. China has the same procurement law in the bakings. So out of 146 countries in the world who signed the UN Convention on the Rights of People with Disability, which was established in 2006, People will tell you this Human Rights Convention of UN, it's equivalent, the importance is equivalent to the Kyoto Treaty on the Green Movement. United States actually led the entire effort of human rights, as we all, I think we can agree. And ADA, American Disability, actually set the gold standard for digital accessibility. But the fact that we are not a member of UN convention, over time, is going to erode our leadership. Why do I know that? I was very fortunate to represent the entire IT industry to testify in front of the US Senate on this particular topic. And it breaks my heart that we weren't able to get the United States Congress. We were six votes short in getting this ratified as other 146 countries. But that said, the digital inclusion standards and digital inclusion future at this point is still set by the US company like Google, like Facebook, like Apple. And that's one of the reasons why this topic is so important because from this point on, we all know that technology is not just system optimization. It affects every single person on this planet. And when I say every single person, I mean it. I don't mean the, the 1% or the 10%. I mean the entire stack, including the base of the pyramid. So in this today's kind of uh, uh, equivalent of what I said, the, R, the RAS for the mainstream, uh, main, uh, mainframe computers, Today, we should be talking about, and we are talking about, for example, um, kind of a computer impact in the terms of privacy, right? Security, because these affects every person. And I will argue that accessibility should be part of that discussion. So therefore, it's PSA, privacy, security, and accessibility, because 
if you truly, if you believe that your solution, whether you are a programmer, your engineer, your designer, whatever you're making, if you want that product or services or solution or apps to be made available to every human being, and you should have every human being as your objective, then you have to think human-centric. You have to think, what can I do on a day-to-day -day basis to make this a reality. A lot of people talk about inclusion and they will say this is a topic the management, you know, at the top should set the standards, set the leadership. And like I said, from my experience, inclusion is everybody's responsibility, especially when it comes down to digital inclusion. Because if you go around and ask people and say, do you believe that everybody should be equal? Everybody will say, of course. And if you go around and say, do you want your product to be only available to some people, not all people? Everybody will say, no. So principally, everybody agree that this is the right thing to do. But when it comes into practice, people will say, on average, believe me, I've heard all kinds of excuses. Oh, my budget is. Is, is, does not allow me to do this, or is not part of our department's priority. So there are all kinds of potential uh, obstacle put in front of you. But on the other hand, as an individual, you actually can make a difference. You can actually be the person, make a conscious decision whether this is an authentic inclusion decision you're going to make as you go about your daily business. So this is one of the kind of a principal um, thinking about authentic inclusion that I would like to uh, kind of share with you. And that at this, again, in this particular time, all of us, you know, have this kind of responsibility, especially in the technology area, because technology is going to be it's, it's not going to be, it's already pervasive in every person's life. And can you imagine if your technology has quote unquote embedded, you know, discriminatory kind of a feature or function? Not by design, not by intention, but by lack of attention, that could happen. So this is really what we're talking about is that how can a company like Google and how can an individual as a Googler, you along with other technology companies together in coming to understand the impact of your behavior and your action on a day-to-day -day basis and how a company can enable you all to do this. And the final point I want to make is that this is a topic that really goes beyond what we call the inclusion. This is a topic about putting human first, putting human in the middle of all your thinking, and as you design, as you think about everything. And, and it's also not a, just an idea, but as an institution, if you're a manager, you actually have the capability to what I call institutionalize the thinking. When I was at IBM, um, we actually take this topic and make it a very holistic in that we have design camps, we have you know, um, development agile uh, processes, we have uh, communication from our marketing department involved in this because this has to be a kind of a central nucleus of a company's ethos to believe in that you as an individual and also you as a company in the technology forefront can impact the society and can also do the kind of uh, equity computing like we were talking about earlier. So this is really the foundational of the, uh, of the thinking. And I can share a lot of the kind of institutional practice examples, but I, at this point, you know, with this audience, perhaps I can open up for questions and then we can have a more of a dialogue instead of me, you know, giving you more of a kind of a, 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 a practice perspective. So any, uh, any question that you may have? Yes. 
So designing a product for like the whole spectrum of uh, populations is really hard. So do you or like does IBM have any framework that could help people make that happen? Well, the, we actually have what we call the design language and thinking. And one of the things that I actually want to talk about, it's very hard to do accessibility by itself because you've separate that out. There seems to be extra effort. So what we did it, is that we work with our design team and got a lot of the concept built into the design thinking. I mean, Google must have a standard design um, process, no? When your product comes out, do you go through um, certain kind of um, testing and, and, and all that? <laughs> okay. Kind of yes, and well, maybe over time, maybe this is something you should think about, right? I mean, so what we did is that for, um, we know that hardware, remember, in our case, we have hardware developers, we have software developers, we have services, so it's very diverse portfolio. But what we did is we kind of uh, create a functional guidance. Think of it as a checklist. So as any uh, developer goes through what we call the concept, uh, design, a plan, and design, and implement stage, we have a checklist for people to kind of use as a guidance. It started out to be a paper checklist. And then, um, then we move on to automated checklists. And now, frankly, we're using AI and based on what the person's uh, creating, we actually can have uh, AI to give um, kind of prompters. And though, by the way, all these are based on standards, right? Earlier I talked about accessibility. This is another thing. Accessibility is not kind of a liberal left-wing um, kind of uh, philosophy. In the digital technology, digital inclusion space, this is actually a highly disciplined and regimented space in that we have standards called WCAT 2.0, or it stands for uh, Web Accessibility Accessibility Guideline, which is, came out of a W3C, you know, a World Wide Web Standards Group. So these are published standards that, remember I mentioned 146 countries? Every country is in the process adopting that standard, just like today in the telco world, everybody's moving to 5G, for example, right? There's a certain, certain set of, uh, uh, of a technology standard. So between World Wide Web, between ITU, between these global ISO standards, there's, there are accessibility standards, just like privacy standards and security standards that are, are, are coming together. So again, Google, as a leader in this kind of a technology, you all actually have the capability to be a leader in terms of, for example, maybe using your artificial intelligence um, capability to integrate all these elements into, um, into maybe an AI, AI-based tool to, to lessen the burden of developers. Does that make sense? So that's, to some degree, also um, the, what, what I mean by um, authentic inclusion framework. That is, inclusion should not just be a buzzword or a statement or an idea. You can and you should have organization constructs such as you know, design criteria, such as development standards, such as testing protocols. Another thing that I don't know whether Google does or not, but if you don't, I highly recommend it, is that you actually have people with, for example, cognitive challenge or vision challenge as part of your testing team. Nothing like a real user that will humble you and also give you potentially out-of-the-box thinking and also a solution. Like I mentioned, I was in, in China in March. Um, China actually just started the accessibility journey less than 10 years ago. So at that time, I actually helped translate Chinese, uh, the, the word accessibility into Chinese, because Chinese actually is my native language. So 10 years ago, you're looking at a country did not even have the word accessibility. 10 years now, when I went back in March, 
it was a, a forum sharing best practices from Baidu, Tencent, Alibaba, and the most impressive, Ant Financial. Anybody heard of Ant Financial? Ant Financial is part of Alibaba. Everybody know Alibaba? Okay. So Ant Financial, think of it as, um, Ali, everybody know Alipay. Alipay is the equivalent to Apple Pay, right? So Alibaba has created this entire e-commerce platform with a payment system. And Ant Financial is their mobile fintech platform. So if, if you Google, if you Google <laughs> Ant Financial, they're in the press every day. Some people would be saying some uh, fintech, you know, fintech financial technology is going through huge, huge uh, transformation. A lot of banks, you know, are actually worried about their existence 10 years from now, right? Because you got all the disruptors, new type of uh, uh, fintech companies coming in. So Ant Financial actually had, um, when they announced their uh, uh, mobile app it was, was in, is inaccessible. So somebody complained, because the social media network is very, very strong in China as well, because everybody has a mobile phone. So what happened was, it kind of went viral. So what did Ant do? And Financial do? They immediately hired um, a team of persons with disabilities, blindness, aging, and all that, and made them a permanent part of their design team and also their testing team. Now, again, in China, they don't have any laws. They don't have ADA. They don't, they don't have anything to say, you must do this. But as a company, I mean, China right now is so consumer driven, it's unbelievable. Talk about uh, focus on customer experience. So the best practice that was shared by Ant Financial is the entire what we call the customer journey, end to end, and how they're embedding user experience, in this case, particularly aging people with disability, into the entire process. And I remember sitting on stage, because like, remember I was the only outside quote unquote expert. And when I was listening to them, I'm like, oh my God, they are like, not only they get it, they are actually surpassing, frankly, a lot of the companies doing here in the United States. So the reason I'm sharing this with you is because this is not your father's accessibility topic anymore. This is not about just making compliance, making ADA, you know, so Google can, uh, can, can be a, a, let's say, federal government contractor. That's me minimum. I'm here to talk to you about this is, if you believe that everybody's going to use technology, you know, like mobile phone, as part of their living, as part of their working, as part of their playing, it's every single activity that human does is going to involve technology, then you must think of accessibility as part of that experience. Because ultimately, accessibility is about extreme personalization. It's not that that person is disabled. It's just my eyesight is not that good, especially when I'm driving. You're not supposed to look at your phone, but you still have email and things coming in. At that point, I would like my screen voice over to come on, just talk to me, right? So this is becoming, think of it as a personal preference. Again, put the human first thinking cap on. And don't think of this as meetings on minimum you know, compliance, but think about how can I make my product, my services, how can I make the company Google to be the human first company that I think about the human experience and then I build you know, things around that human experience. I build it for the human experience. And that is to me a true leader's um, action. And if you do so, then all the other things, including inclusion, will come about naturally, organically. Then you're not going out to hire a woman because you're supposed to hire a woman. You're not out hiring a, a blind person because you're supposed to hire a person with disability, and so on and so forth. Because 
What you believe fundamentally then is that technology is here to stay, not only here to stay, technology is going to be an integral part of every human exis existence. I mean, we didn't talk about AI, artificial intelligence and all that, but if you start carry on, you know, do extrapolation where the technology is going, it's going to be everything we do and everything we think was that I have the opportunity to be um, at the conference in Sao Paulo, Brazil with Vin Cerf, your own, right? Vin and I were talking about job of the future. He certainly man invented internet, so he talked about how he view you all know Vin's vision now is this people-centered internet, right? So internet, from his perspective, has kind of gone away from the original purpose of serving people too. So he's having this PCI, people-centered internet kind of um, vision. And I'm coming in from my, my kind of uh, uh, pragmatic, um, operational uh, experience in managing IBM's <clears throat> accessibility um, organization and seeing how by thinking human first and by people having diversity on my team and also throughout the IBM design team, IBM development team, how that actually differentiated us as a company in terms of a product and services, and most importantly, a culture, right? It's because I would, I would tell you that, I would say the last point I want to make is that one of the things I always, uh, when, I, when I was uh, uh, um, on, that, on that day, I was sharing is that everybody in the technology business is about innovation. We all know that if you don't have innovation, you die. I mean, it's just fact, facts of life, right? So how do you make sure you have continuous innovation that's transformative, that's disruptive, right? And if you look at the history of a company, right now IBM, I think, is the only company that has over 100 years of reinventing itself. Then you peel back and you say, what is the secret sauce? What is the thing that's make this company, at least so far, sustain you know, wave and waves of, uh, of innovation. Fundamentally, is this belief in diversity. So Google, you are in the tech world, the undisputed leader. And so therefore, as a company, actually Google along with, you know, um, uh, Microsoft and uh, Apple, all the technology company, we owe it to the world, frankly, to kind of not only promote, but deliver some of the fundamental promise of technology, which is technology is supposed to equalize access. Technology is supposed to create a democracy. And technology should have a purpose. And that's what we all have as an opportunity in front of us. And that's why when Sarah told me that, I, that there, you know, there's an opportunity to speak at Google, I jumped at it right away because I sincerely believe that in this particular time in our history, if you look around, whether the political system, economic system, societal system, everything seems to be in upheaval. And we technologists have a responsibility Use what we know on a day-to-day -day basis to better this world. And one of the way to better the world is to make sure that we're not just doing technology for technology's sake, but always keep humans first as part of your thinking. So with that, I don't know whether we still have about 10 minutes. Uh, we still can take one or two questions. And we can do the karaoke Hello. way. <laughs> yeah. um, how do you think about technologies that are um, sort of by their very nature less accessible. So I'm thinking of things like AR and VR, which is very visual, or um, like voice, uh, like voice assistants, which obviously wouldn't work very well for people with hearing impairment, uh, things like that. I, I personally think that um, there will be um, 
there will be a convergence of a different technology coming together to multimodal kind of experience. And um, it's, it's not to say for a, a specific function that um, you, let's say it's, it's a VR, it's a completely visual, right? But even that, you can use, for example, um, uh, machine learning or artificial intelligence to interpret the scene um, for the person who cannot see. So one of the, for example, one of the biggest um, piece of work Disney is working on is used to be that when you go see a movie, um, if you're blind, you cannot, obviously you cannot see, right? So they have audio description of the scene. So if you've done enough of audio description of scenery, one can imagine that can be captured, right? You can, you can digitize that and then you begin to be de develop a repository and that's so that even as you develop the virtual reality kind of either games experience and whatever, you can still have voice, you know, uh, over. So you can use the technology's um, kind of efficiency, uh, uh, cost effectiveness factor to begin to integrate um, multiple, um, multiple technology together. So. In the beginning, it could be a single thread, but I think if you design and thinking that you want to be pervasively accessible, then you may start engaging other technology to, to complement that. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, I want to thank Francis for this uh, very insightful and inspiring presentation.